With the launch of Intel's new Alder Lake 12th generation CPUs yesterday comes a new socket and chipset. One that is wildly different from their previous generations, which warrants a, a bit of an explanation. There is a lot to cover here though, so let's just jump straight in. The new chipset you'll need to run any of these 12th gen CPUs is Z690. It's a massive change from previous boards, which means that it isn't compatible with any other generations of Intel CPUs, nor are the older boards compatible with these new ones. The biggest reason for that is the new socket. It's called LGA 1700, and as the name might suggest, has 1700 pins in the socket, up from 1200 on the last gen. And it's actually a different shape for the first time on a desktop Intel chip, now coming as a rectangular package instead of square. This socket is actually new in more ways than just the pin count. When you try and install a CPU, you'll notice something a little different. The retaining lever arm is still there on the right, and it still lifts upwards, but now when you unhook it and lift it up, the retaining bracket now folds down away from the CPU, and it sort of hinges at the bottom instead of up at the top. It still clips back into place the same way, it's just a, a reversed orientation. It's also worth noting that the cooler mounting holes are in a slightly different position on LGA 1700. It's a ever so slightly wider mount, although ASUS has included the LGA 1200 mounting holes here as well, and they overlap quite heavily, I guess for better backwards compatibility. But I should note that you should be careful using an LGA 1200 mounting kit with these new chips, as the LGA 1700 mounting hardware that Corsair includes with their new H150i that I've been using for some of my testing, they are, the standoffs are about a, a touch over a millimeter shorter, which means it's possible that you'll have incorrect mounting pressure when using the old hardware, which could help contribute to even worse temperatures than you, well, can probably already expect with the higher end chips. Now, beyond the new socket, there is a lot of new features and things that you should know about. The primary of which is RAM support. This has already been one of the big talking points, and as you may might have seen, Alder Lake CPUs support both DDR4 and DDR5 fully, albeit with some performance differences between them, but that's a pretty big deal, and it's really important that everyone who is considering picking up one of these new chips and one of these new boards understands how it works. DDR4 and DDR5 while they do have the same number of pins, or physical pins on the slots, are not the same. They are not directly compatible with each other. You can't fit a DDR4 DIN in a DDR5 slot, or vice versa. When picking a Z5 uh, 690 motherboard, you'll need to be very careful to check which version of RAM it supports. Some boards are being sold with DDR4 slots on them, like ASUS's TUF D4, but this ASUS Z690 Hero, that supports DDR5. It's also worth pointing out that Intel's spec for memory is DDR4-3200 or DDR5-4800. Anything higher than that is considered overclocking and voids your CPU's warranty, although the boards themselves can support significantly higher in both cases. Timings aren't something that Intel specs for, so you can get as low timings as you can for either type of RAM. Something else that's new for this generation is the PCIe connectivity. You might have seen the headline that these new chips support PCIe Gen 5. And while well, technically they do, I feel like you're being somewhat, let's say, misled by that statement. Take a look at Intel's block diagram for their chipset connectivity. See the block in the top left? It reads 1x16 PCIe 5.0 readiness lanes plus 1x4 PCIe 4 lanes. PCIe 5.0 readiness lanes? What does that mean? 
Well, it means that in theory, should a PCIe 5 device, well, first of all, exist, and second of all, connect to that top X16 slot, it should work at PCIe Gen 5. The block diagram does show support for bifurcation, which is splitting those 16 lanes into two X8 connections, but on this ASUS Z690 Hero board, only the top X16 slot, at least currently, supports PCIe Gen 5 in the BIOS, so none of the M.2 slots get Gen 5, nothing through the chipset does either, only the top X16 slot that normally houses your GPU. And like I mentioned in the i9 review, if you haven't watched that by the way, do check that out in the cards above, there's still a, a bit of a, well, lack of a, a need for Gen 5. Gen 4 is already very underutilized, so it's going to be a very long time before that is a, a key selling point. With that said, the, these boards and these chips have a whole lot more bandwidth, kind of full stop. You've got four Gen 4 lanes direct to the CPU for the top M.2 SSD, then eight DMI 4.0 lanes to the chipset, up from DMI 3.0 lanes in Z590. In theory, that's basically the same as upgrading from PCI Gen 3 to Gen 4, which means that you get increased connectivity through the chipset. Looking at the block diagram for this Z690 Hero, you'll see a crazy amount of connections. 2.5 gate Ethernet, Wi-Fi 6E, two Thunderbolt 4 ports, a PCI Gen 4 uh, X4 slot, two M.2 SSDs, one Gen 3, one Gen 4, extra SATA ports, and a whole, whole lot of USB Gen 2 and 2x2 ports. That's a lot of I.O. And actually with eight lanes going to the chipset, that's technically double what AMD's X570 platform currently has, which has four lanes of PCI Gen 4. Something that isn't all that new to Intel boards is the beefy, beefy VRMs. The i9-12900K chokes down 241 watts at stock and thanks to their new maximum turbo power setup, it will draw that endlessly, rather than boosting to that for a short period of time and then dropping back down to a more reasonable power level, which means that the load on the VRMs is no longer limited to short bursts of high power, instead potentially subjected to sustained high power draw, which means that these new boards have to swell their power phases even further. The Hero board I have here has 20 90 amp power phases on board, set up as 10 double channels from a Renesas RA229131 controller using Intercell ISL 99390 drivers and a heatsink with more mass than some entire motherboards. Even with all of that heft and heatsink material, this is still clearly working hard when the i9 is running full tilt, even at stock. I should make it clear, it is more than capable of handling it, for sure. In fact, if you know, you could even overclock, assuming you could keep the chip itself cool, uh, relatively easily. The board is definitely overbuilt, but you will need to make sure that you have good airflow over the heat sinks, overclocking or not. Now, as with any large motherboard launch, the motherboard vendors bring a new set of unique features themselves. This generation, ASUS has gone pretty heavy on some new features, some of which are aesthetic, things like the new pixelated polymo light panel on the rear IO shield or rear IO cover, uh, but some of them are actually functional and fantastic. First is their Q release button. This is basically a cable that is tied to the top X16 PCIe slots locking tab. So instead of having to reach past your GPU, uh, you know, the cooler or a thick backplate, and then push the, the little tab down, you just push the button and it pulls the locking tab out of the way and you can remove your graphics card. 
Well, the majority of people who build with a full system with these boards are unlikely to use that more than a handful of times. It's still a great feature to have and something I really like as someone who, you know, rebuilds PCs to test stuff every five minutes. But for me, their M.2 lockers are far, far more useful. Sadly, you do still need a screwdriver to remove the two now captive screws that hold the heatsink on. Captive is a great touch, although I can't explain just how much of a pain it is to try and put the heatsink back on when you then can't line up the, the screws that are already sticking through it with the standoffs, and especially because it's for the top M.2 slot, they tuck that heatsink under the rear IO cover, and so it's even more difficult. But anyway, once you get the heatsink off, you'll notice a little gray dial. That is a little swivel tap. So when you insert an M.2 drive, all you need to do is spin it round and that's it, sorted. Your drive is secured and in place. This is a really nice touch and saves you trying to install a, a tiny little standoff and then even tinier screws just to hold your drives in place. There is one other catch to Z690, and that's the price tag. The entry-level Z690 boards are currently listed for £200, with the, the more midfield options sitting at much more like £300, and this hero? This is £520, and this isn't even the highest end non-watercooled board that ASUS offers. That honour goes to the extreme, which is £930. You're looking at over £100 more going from a Z590 Strix F to a Z690 Strix F. So you really need to keep that sort of pricing in mind when comparing both to 11th gen chips and especially to Ryzen since ASUS's B550 Strix F is only selling for £170 instead. So that's a quick look at Z690, the, the things that you should know if you're planning on picking up this new platform, a bit about some of the new features including motherboard specific features, and a just general look. If you have any questions do feel free to leave those in the comments down below, and if you haven't already I highly recommend that you check out the i9 review that came out yesterday, it'll be in the cards above or on the end cards for you to check out. It has a lot uh, more detail, also a lot of testing, both of the P cores and E cores independently of each other, including gaming results for those. So I highly, highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on the Z690 platform uh, in general in the comments down below. Do you think that this is a platform that you're going to upgrade to? And if so, uh, which chip are you planning on getting? Also, what do you think about the, the pricing, the PCIe Gen 5, DDR4, DDR5, all of that stuff? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. I'll leave some links to both the new chips and some Z690 boards and probably even some DDR5 RAM in the description for you to check out. Those will be Amazon affiliate links that will take you to your local Amazon store where you can see pricing when and where you watch this because I'm quoting UK pricing since that's where I am and it can definitely vary especially when you watch this. You know, A few months time for example might be a, a lot cheaper, I hope. Probably not, but anyway, that's that. Uh, like I said, there'll be plenty of videos on the end cards, including the i9 review. There's also a load of links in the description you can check out if you want to support the channel and keep me making these videos, including the insane amount of hours I spent on benchmarking the i9 and all of the other chips. So uh, any support is greatly appreciated. And yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.